amazingly beautiful day the Lord has given us to be <coughs> inside. It's just gorgeous outside. So thank you for being with us. We're a congregation that is seeking Christ and sharing His love. Hope you experience that. If you're with us virtually, we are grateful you are in our midst as well. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 33. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God.
that each time
So it's great to be together. If you're watching with us online, we want you to participate in the connection card. There's a button above the live feed. Just click on that and we'll walk you through the giving process. And everyone, please, please, please stand up and greet someone, maybe make a new friend. It's good to be together. You know that we love music at First Presbyterian Church, and we love kids at First Presbyterian Church, and I am so excited to introduce our new director of children's music, Suzanne Stanley, who are going to be working with our kids on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, and other times, so introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit. I think my favorite part is Benjamin was my entrance music. I felt like a pro wrestler. It was yes. Great. Nice, Benjamin. <laughs> All right, so I will be the director for these kiddos up here. I'm really excited. They're a great group of kids. I've gotten to know them over the past few years. Yeah. And yeah, we got a lot of stuff planned, so bring your kiddos. It's going to be great. I'm really excited to start teaching them today. We are starting to learn a song that we will be performing in a couple weeks. Excellent. Yeah. And she is the director of our Christmas pageant, so kids get ready. Get ready. And um, planning stuff, if your child, um, your child likes to perform, That'll be great. They can come out. We have plenty of roles. Like we're gonna make that yeah. work. But then also, if your child um, maybe has a little bit of stage fright but still wants to be involved, we're gonna make room for them too. So don't let not wanting to be on stage be yes. uh, a, know, deterrent. a deterrent. A deterrent. Yes. 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 We are super excited to have you. Um, we are thrilled to have you. All right, Jim. I'd like for you to come up. So finally, we've been telling these kids for weeks we were gonna bless their backpacks. And if you didn't bring your backpacks, that's okay. We're going to bless you since we've all started our school year and we want to give you a little something here from our children's ministry. Each year, um, as part of our tradition of starting a new school year, we give you something to put on your backpack to remind you that God is always with you and that you have a church family that loves you and is praying for you to succeed and they're praying for your safety and they're pr praying that you have great days and that you have wonderful teachers that love you and a staff that takes care of you and all of those wonderful things. So Jim is going to pray over you in your backpacks this morning and we will give you some of these on your way back from Children's Church. Great. So, so boys and girls, you're going to get these and be able to put on your backpacks for everybody else. It is, uh, it's actually the blessing, sort of the, the, sort of the traditional blessing in uh, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his face towards you and give you peace. So let's pray, and then you, then you guys can go on and have a great time. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we pray your spirit upon these beautiful children and upon the journey that they have in school and just the opportunities to grow and to know. And we just pray that you would continually bless them and their families and fill them with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So while our kids are going out, go ahead and find your Bibles, and let's go to the, to the Gospel of John. We're going to begin with the first verse. I think it's page 1026, something like that. 
in the paging of your pew Bibles. And if you're using an electronic device or you're with us virtually, uh, I would encourage you to use the New International Version, the NIV, simply because that's what we've got up here and it's just uh, good for us to have the same wording. Now, <clears throat> remember Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament is before Jesus. The New Testament or the New Covenant is with Jesus. In the New Testament, the first four books <clears throat> are what we call the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three of those four, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are, <clears throat> are what we call the synoptic Gospels. It's really where we get the word synopsis. It's an overview, sort of a begin to end, sort of this is what happened, more chronological, just kind of you know this, 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 of the ministry of Jesus. When you get to the fourth gospel, the Gospel of John, you realize very quickly that it is not really an overview. It is, rather than moving like this, it really is much more vertical. It's this spiritual understanding of the things that Jesus did and said. <clears throat> and you'll see that from the, from the absolute very beginning. <clears throat> now, one of the things that John does that's helpful for us today is that he uses what we would call in literature a trope. Um, it's, a, it's a sense of, basically, it's a, a format for a story that is based on a prior story. So like, you know, just when I say to you once upon a time, you know exactly what I'm doing, right? I'm using a trope. I'm using an image of, or, or, or a, 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 just a, a way for you to know we have a fairy tale and what's going to kind of come with that. So he, John does this throughout. <clears throat> Today you're going to see what that trope is very early in the text. So I want you to think about, as you're reading this and hearing this, think about what it might remind you of in the Old Testament. And I think whether you've been very churched or not, you may get it almost in the beginning. Okay? So, listen for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. To him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Word of the Lord. So, exciting week for us at First Presbyterian. Picnic today. Hot dogs, bounce house, all kinds of balloons, snow cones, snow cones, snow cones, Alina. Uh, just great, great stuff. And, and it's been super exciting. South Carolina won a football game yesterday. And this has been a great weekend. <clears throat> it's also been a great week for us at the church. Some really great things happening in our midst. And one of those was the day after Labor Day, Tuesday, our preschool kicked off again. So about 170 kids or so showed up, many of them brand new, and all of them, even if they have been here, uh, are moving up in a class, a new teacher, new setting, maybe a new always a new classroom, maybe a new hallway to learn to walk down. <clears throat> and so I'd like to go at the very beginning of the day and just kind of hang out with the parents as they're coming in. <clears throat> and it's always fascinating because you'll have, you'll have some parents that'll bring a child in, particularly like the first timers, right? This child's brand new, <clears throat> coming in, and they will, um, they'll come in and 
make sure that want to make sure their kid's going to do okay, their little girl's going to get settled in, their little boy's going to do well, and they get they get their child in the classroom, and and they're they're walking out, and they're kind of weeping, and they just don't know how it's going to go, and you know, and it's just. And then you've got other parents that get their child in there, and they get out of here as fast as they can go, <clears throat> right? So, so we got all of this kind of going on, and it's just, it's fascinating. So I love the preschool. I go down almost every single day when I'm here and just kind of just walk through the halls. There's something just beautiful about it to be around those children, except on the first day. Um, so you go down on the first day, and you learn there is something, there's some social dynamic. If a one-year-old child starts to cry in a classroom, every child thinks they're supposed to cry, <clears throat> right? Or sometimes a child that's three or four years old, been here since they were a baby, they go to a new classroom and it's just hard for them, and so they're just crying. And so how it all plays in, it's just kind of interesting. And I say to the parents always, like I promise you, the first day of class and the last day of class for this year will be radically different. The first day, maybe your child wants to stay with you or is afraid to, to, to embark in a new classroom. But by the last day of class, it's almost a guarantee that that child will actually want to stay here rather than go home. So it's just beautiful. And so I, I started just doing this, right? I'm just walking through the hallway by myself. We're about an hour in, hearing kids crying, hearing some classes going. It's all just the way it is the first day. And I had the most bizarre thing. I got into like almost like a panic attack where this angst kind of came over me. And I love being down there. And I don't mind that things are just getting settled. <clears throat> and I've been thinking about it, like what in the world was going on? And I think what actually happened for me, I think it was a memory that I may not even be able to see, but a memory of a first day of school and how scared to death I was. Were you one of those kids that started and it was just like, oh, I don't know, will I fit in? Will I know anybody? Will I fit? And, and it happens not only the first day of preschool or the first day of kindergarten or, or, or the first day of first grade or a new school. And, and I've been reflecting on that. I don't think that the children that cry are necessarily crying because they're afraid of what's to come. I don't think they're going to be at bodily harm by being here. I don't think they're even necessarily just attached to their mom or dad. I think one of the things that's perhaps deeper that happens for every single person as they enter into something new is this innate thing within us, this need to be seen. This need to, to be known, to be understood. And so when I come as a one, two, three, four, five, fifty something year old, there's within us this need to, to feel as if someone sees us. And it's a great beauty and privilege that all of you who are teachers have is every year, regardless of the age that you may teach, whether it be from college or whether it be through preschool, you have this amazing opportunity and privilege to be able to help every single student that you have to know that somewhere along the line you desire to see them, to see them as they are, as, they, as who they are. I think it's a great need, not just for the first day of school, I think it's a great need we have when we come to church. It's a beautiful thing to come and worship and I'm so grateful that you do. But if we come to worship and then we bug out just as soon as we can and and it's about the worship experience, I think we miss something. I think we miss the opportunity to, to see and to be seen. I think it's the same thing for our work. <clears throat> you know, I said to you before, I think it's something like one of the more recent, I think a Pew study, looked at people that had a choice of a salary increase or a changed position description, title. And something like 70% of people would rather have a title change than a raise. It's not that they're not interested in money, but there's something that's even deeper than that. This, this idea that I'm, that I'm noted, I'm recognized, I'm understood for what I do, for what my contribution is, for, for who I may be. The same thing with, us, with friends. I mean, we, had, we think about what's the definition of friend. Is it someone you spend the most time with, perhaps? No. I think the definition of true friendship is someone who sees you and you see them. 
and the need we have in a family to be seen. The Bible calls it beholding, to be able to truly look and to behold someone else. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned this book last week by David Brooks, um, How to Know a Person. It's one of his most recent books, came out I think less than a year ago. And I told another illustration, but one of the things that Brooks does in this book, and it's not, it's not a Christian book, even though there's a good bit of Jesus in it. It's, uh, he does this beginning where he says, basically, there are two types of people. Two types of people. He says there are diminishers and there are illuminators. And, and what he means by that is he says, you know, diminishers, sort of Jim's interpretation, are the people that you ever been to a dinner party or a gathering of people and you meet someone and you know immediately that they're sizing you up, right? They're just asking you a couple of introductory questions, trying to size you up, figure out whether they want to invest in a conversation with you or not. Does that make sense? I mean, the, the, the times where, where, you know, you just, you know, they, they just... They just want to check you out and they want to see, well, yeah, okay, I'll have a conversation with you or no, I'm going to find a maybe polite way, but I'm going to move off. And those diminishers are people that aren't necessarily trying to make you feel bad about yourself, not trying to hurt you, though they may, to feel better about themselves. I think it's more the sister's disregard that's not seeing. And I would say that those diminishers are the people, and we're all like this at points in our life, who are really after something transactional. Am I going to get enough from this person to develop a friendship or to have a conversation? If not, I'll just move on and find someone with whom I can. Now, we all do this. How many times do we walk along the street and we do not make eye contact with someone who passes us by? And so we walk along and say, oh, that was my mom. That was sort of a joke. It didn't work in either of the other two services. So I really regret even trying it here with you all. <clears throat> But we, we do this, right? Where we just, we choose not to make eye contact. We choose not to engage because we don't have the time or we don't want to take the time or there's not enough of a transaction that's in there. So there are these diminishers in life. <clears throat> and Brooks says, then there are the illuminators. And the illuminators are the ones who, who really desire to see people in their fullness. They were what I would call the seers. The ones who, you ever been to a dinner party where you, um, you are a, um, you know, you're a guest and someone comes up to you and, you know, they just introduce themselves, you start talking and they ask you questions and they just ask you more questions and they start to engage you in these ways and they find these connections with you and, and you start to realize, man, I've been talking and this is gone and time has flown and these are the illuminators, right? I <clears> mean, <throat> the people that that truly want to kind of see who you are, for us to be able to see who someone is. I've had both of those happen to me in other settings just recently. It wasn't long ago I was invited to something. I'm usually with my people, which is you. So I was invited to something, and um, mostly non-church folks, and the guy seated across from me made it clear within about 45 seconds that he was not going to speak to me the entire evening. It was just clear. He spoke to the person on my left, the person on my right, the person on his left, the person on my right, but not me. And it was weird. I mean, it's weird when that happens. It doesn't necessarily make you angry or maybe even hurt you. It's just odd. And then I've been in settings where people had no idea who I was and they just come up and start talking and engaging. And it's just, they illuminate you. They make you feel... Now, the thing that Brooks says with this is fascinating to me. He says that we're not born as a diminisher or an illuminator. <clears throat> he says that, that to be like an illuminator, it's a craft, a set of skills, a way of life, he says. It's something that we develop and we choose to develop in our lives. So Iris Murdoch, The Sovereignty of Good, little thin philosophy book, really hard and deep to read. I get that. But here's a story she tells in The Sovereignty of Good that I think is fascinating. She tells a story of a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. She calls the mother-in-law M and the daughter-in-law D, right? D for daughter, M for mother. Okay. The mother-in-law is absolutely kind and courteous and gracious to her daughter-in-law all the time. 
She says only good things to her and about her. She speaks kindness to her. She's encouraging of her. She is what you would call like the perfect mother-in-law. Are we together? But in her heart, she doesn't like her daughter-in-law. She's kind to her. You would never know it in any interaction between them or to observe anything. But she resents her. She doesn't think that she's necessarily good enough to be married to her son. She doesn't think that she's very serious. She's flippant or maybe bird-brained or whatever her mind might be thinking. She doesn't think that she has the qualities perhaps to, to raise children in the way that she thinks that they should be raised. And yet when she's with her or anytime she speaks of her, it's nothing but kindness. And so one day the mother-in-law decides that she just doesn't <clears throat> want to continue in that. And she decides, well, I'm stuck with her. So I'm just going to do my best to see good in her. And so she begins and something happens and there's a conversation and a time where she might have thought that her daughter-in-law was sort of flippant or, 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 or not intellectual or whatever. And she starts to think, well, you know, that's a beautiful way of seeing things. Or it's just powerful to be able to to boil something down into a simple understanding. Or, or the way she interacts with her husband and, and her, her son-in-law. Well, it's just beautiful to see their interaction rather than before where she would be critical about the words that were shared. All of this she starts to decide for herself to see her daughter-in-law differently. And the thing that happens for her is she changes. Murdoch says it's to grow by looking. That we actually grow by looking. It, she says really that how we see is how we will become. That if we see something, it, you ever been around somebody that everything is just wrong? Like you could say to someone, I've got people in my life that I could say to them today, isn't this the most beautiful day? It's perfect outside. Yep, it is. But you know it's going to rain on Friday. And, and, and honestly, people that are like that, it's not only that say, well, yeah, but can't you just enjoy it? It's perfect and beautiful today. Yeah, but you know, it's so wonderful today. I'm just going to remember how, how beautiful it is and how, when it's so bad on Friday. I mean, we have, we see, we can be like that. I mean, you ever have someone that seems to be everything they, they see is a danger? Like, and it's election year. Whether you're red or blue, everything's going to fall apart if you're not red or blue. And it's just sense that, though. And I'm not trying to minimize the distinctions and the differences, but sometimes they're just sometimes they're just people. Sometimes there's seasons in our life where it's just like it's just, everything's a danger. This could happen. Oh, you could fall. You could fall off of that. You ever watch sometimes a, a mom on a playground with a little kid or a dad on the playground? No, 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 no. You, you you could fall. And the thing is true is that if everything you see is a danger, it actually becomes a danger. And so so this. This opportunity that we have to grow by looking is to sort of have a different way. It's a, it's a craft, a set of skills, a, a way of life, because how we see is how we will become. And it's a flip side as well. If we see beauty, the world becomes more beautiful to us. If we see hope and promise, the world, the people with whom we interact, the experiences that we have, our lives become more hopeful and promising. Now I say all of this because for us as these followers of Jesus, it's very clear that Jesus is the ultimate seer, the ultimate illuminator, the one, the one who sees every single person in every encounter as the image of God. Whether they be for Jesus or against him, whether they be broken or whether they think they're whole, Jesus sees every single person as bearing the image of his Father, the image of God, the image of himself. <clears throat> and it's beautiful and it's powerful because when you read the stories of Jesus, he beholds everyone. The ones that resent Jesus, the ones that want Jesus killed, the ones that want something from Jesus, the ones who love Jesus. He beholds everyone. But it gets even better. And that's what brings us to John chapter 1. And so I told you earlier that John uses what we might call a trope, right? He uses a story format and he lays another story upon it. And so this one, did you pick up on what the story is, right? And I gave it to you as a little trick at the beginning. You might see it in the beginning. Listen again. In the beginning was the word. Where are we now? 
Genesis chapter 1. The very first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God said, in the beginning the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made and has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so we have this image of the Word being Jesus. We see that in this text, actually. It's clear. But we have this trope of light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, If you go back and look at Genesis, it's really interesting because the sun wasn't created until the fourth day. Go back and look at it. It's clear. So when God says in the first day, let there be light, what's he talking about? He's not talking about the sun. It doesn't occur until the fourth day. In the first day, when God says, let there be light and there is light, John says, this is the word, this is Jesus. That Jesus is the light. And the thing that's fascinating about it is this first day light, this illumination of God, lets us see everything else as it truly is. So, for example, if God had created the sun on the first day and let it be light, then we could read all of the creation account and say this is about history or it's about science And we can try to delve into it in those ways of topics of history or topics of science. But God doesn't do that. God wants to bring something more powerful, more beautiful, more meaningful. Something for us to see about the presence of God. The light that comes even before the world is created. And even as the world is created. So now, when I trust and believe that that light is God, that this is the Jesus, the Son of God... Then when I read about the creation, I see the beauty of creation. I don't just see it as something that happened. I see the power of it. I see the beauty of the stars, the beauty of the mountains, the beauty of the hills, the beauty of humanity. You see, this is how we see, is how we become children of God. This is what John says. There are those who came in his own who did not receive him. And yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. You see, we become children of God by what we see. We become children by seeing like the Father, by seeing like Jesus, by being able to have this first day light and then see everything else. And the Bible's clear. It says we become children of God. It's a process. It's a learned ability. Just as Brooks would say about illuminators in life, the craft, a set of skills, or a way of life. <clears throat> Think about a baby. When a baby's born, Fresh from their mother's womb, their eyesight is just a few inches. But as they mature, as they age, their eyesight gets better and better and better and better. And so it is for us as the children of God. We don't just have this experience with God, this encounter, being knocked off a horse by lightning or being knocked down, even the experience that Paul had, and then immediately get it all. We enter into the process of becoming the children of God, with this learned ability. And the thing that's beautiful about it is how we see as we grow in becoming this child of God allows us to what we see to become. So let me back up with this because this is really good. How we see allows what we see to become. Back to the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law. The mother-in-law doesn't like her daughter-in-law. She's kind to her. But she decides she needs to give her a chance or she needs to see her in a new way. And she does. And as that process goes on, the mother-in-law changes, right? But here's the power of the kingdom. 
In the kingdom of God, not simply does the mother-in-law change, but the daughter-in-law changes too. And it does change by new words. The mother in laws always been kind. But there's something about the Spirit of God when we truly desire to see someone. It's not the words. It's not the skill. It's not... It's simply that desire, and that begins to change what's being observed, almost like quantum physics. What we see changes, not just how we understand it. Day one allowed all the other days to follow. So I was telling our men at our men's breakfast yesterday this little story. Um, Valina is from Tennessee. If you've ever talked to Valina, you know she's from Tennessee. Um, and in fact, it, when Valina's fresh back from being in Tennessee, she's really from Tennessee, <coughs> right? East Tennessee, right? Where, where all the tea is sweet and everybody's called honey, right? <coughs> Absolutely true. So, <coughs> so Valina was back visiting her family, her mom and dad, and she went to her home church. <coughs> and while she's at her home church, where she was kind of birthed into the faith, where she grew up, her parents are still active there, a little Presbyterian church. She, um, she, she came across this guy named Bob Miller. And she sent me a picture of her with Bob Miller. Bob Miller is 105 years old. And he is still standing. Lord. <coughs> right? And not only standing, but still talking. <coughs> and cognizant and everything. Just great, right? Incredible. And, and she just sends this to me. And she says, this was my confirmation teacher when I was a little girl. And so... I don't know why, a couple of days ago, I went into Valina's office and I said, Valina, I've been thinking about that picture you sent me uh, with the, you know, the, the old guy. And she said, Bob Miller. Immediately, everything changed in Valina's countenance. And she looked at me, and you know the first thing she said about Bob Miller? She said, Jim, he taught me how to shake a hand. And I thought, of all the things to be able to say, to start with, he taught me how to shake a hand was fascinating to me. And then as Melina just started just smiling and talking about Bob Miller, it came to me that, that this was someone years ago who believed in her, who saw something in her perhaps she didn't see in herself, who cared enough for her, who saw her enough to want to invest in her, even in small ways of how to shake a hand. And I believe that, that Bob Miller, believing in Valina all those years ago, have been a critical part of who she is today. A pastor, yes. A friend, a colleague, even more for me. A person who pursues the goodness of God in every way she knows and the beauty of God. All from or in part from someone who she would say believed in her. And so from that conversation till today I have been reviewing my life. Reviewing my life And I will say to you that that one of the things as a leader, and I think every one of us are leaders here, every leader can find no greater encouragement than someone to come to you and say, you saw something in me I didn't see myself. You believed in me. And I think of those experiences. I think it's the same for Jesus and Peter in the Gospel of John that we're reading this fall. At the very end, Peter... He's betrayed Jesus, denied him three times. Jesus has died, he's been resurrected. Peter and a group of guys go fishing, they don't know what else to do. Jesus is cooking fish, invites him to come along as the risen Lord. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. Again, do you love me? Yes, tend my lambs. Again, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. You see what Jesus is doing is Jesus is seeing something in Peter that he didn't see himself. He still believes in him, even though Peter had denied him, even though Peter was a broken, humiliated man. 
And I think it's the same offering, the same privilege for us to be able to live and to do the same. And so I've been thinking about my life, and I can come up with, after days of reviewing, I can come up with four times I remember someone saying to me, I believe in you. And the odd thing about it is they're almost perfectly placed in the timeline of my life. And I will say as well that every one of those four times when someone said, I believe in you, my life changed or began to change. For me to be able to see something in my life that I didn't see, something in myself that I didn't even believe, to believe in something perhaps that seemed to be so big or so different or so... And then I go back to walking down the preschool hallway and I think of all of these fears that are there because ultimately every single one of us needs to be seen, to be beheld. And I realize this amazing power that comes in being able to truly simply seek to see someone and to be able to say and to believe in and for them, I see something in you. I believe in you. Just as Jesus did to Peter. Just as we have had done, spoken into our lives from time to time. This incredible power that comes. There's something unbelievable about believing. Unbelievable about believing. So powerful is it. And this is what we hold. <clears throat> because we're children of God. Not simply made in the image of God, but to find the image in others. We have this amazing privilege to be able to speak and to create something that had never been seen or believed before, even in the lives of others. And I wonder if we claim this power, if this just simply being able to say and to believe, I believe in you, if it wouldn't change the world. And it maybe starts with just teaching someone that matters enough to you how to shake a hand. Amen. Friends, we have the wonderful privilege of responding to God's love and word for us by giving of our tithes and offerings. In a moment, our ushers will come forward to do that. And as they pass the plate down your pew, we encourage you to place the connection card as well as your offering into the, into the plate. If you're watching online, you can participate in the offering as well. There's a button above the live feed that says give. Just click on that button and it will walk you through the giving process or anyone can use text to give. And that number is 757-530-5683. You type in the word give, the amount you'd like to give, send the text and it will walk you through the giving process. So let us continue to worship. Let us continue to celebrate God's amazing love for us.
Jesus, you are our light. You are the greatness in this world. And we pray, Lord, that as you receive these offerings, that your greatness will be known not only in our hearts, but in how we live, so that others can come to know you, love you, and serve you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of the As we move into a time of prayer, we want to lift up so many places in the world. Today we, we lift up prayers for Sudan, for our, brother, our, sis, our Christian brothers and sisters in China, for our Tree of Lives partners in Kenya, and prayers for peace in Turkey. In our nation, we lift up our president, the Congress, and Senate, and all the decisions that they make for our country. Those affected by the school shooting in Winder, Georgia, and also the shooting in Kentucky just yesterday. We lift up those who are unsafe in their own homes. And in our city, we lift up um, those in the healthcare field as they bring healing and hope to those in our community, for our mayors and city leaders. And in our church family, we are so very grateful for everyone who gave blood on Thursday at, at our annual blood drive. For the 24 hours of prayer, we had over um, 70 people praying um, the last 24 hours, so thank you for that. And we also want to lift up those who are in, in a season of loss, for Joe Massey upon the death of his brother Jay, and for Christina and Kenny Warden upon the death of her father. We lift up um, Carol Davis's grandson, Will Lockley. Um, we've mentioned him before, third year student at UVA is recovering now um, Now in Charlottesville. They've transported him from Colorado. Um, Will has seven spine fractures, two broken ribs, and is in a neck collar and wheelchair for the next three months. So his, his um, recovery will be slow. Um, so just continued prayers for pers perseverance for him and for his family. We also want to continue to pray for healing for Linda Johnson and continued prayers for Chris McKinnon Hing, for Don Bray, Tom and Lynn Jones, Nancy McGee, Failing Hathaway, and Tom Celeste. You'll also see in your bulletin today um, the Believe devotional. We'll be having one of these every week. And this week's spiritual practice is celebration. So you can actually pretty much check that off your list if you just go outside and eat a hot dog but, and enjoy our, our, our church family. But this is a wonderful way for you to, to take this this, um, this practice of celebration into your daily life. So we hope that you will do that. Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our illuminator, that your light shines so brightly in that first, in that first kind of light. And we pray, Lord, that we would see you and we would see others through the light that you offer to us. We thank you for, for people like Bob Miller and so many others that encourage us and believe in us even before we know how to believe in ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that you are with those that are so dear to our hearts that are in pain or suffering from loss. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon us and be upon them. We also pray, Lord, for the places in this world that need your care and attention and peace, and that your Holy Spirit would blow the kind of peace that only you can give, a peace that passes all understanding. 
And so we lift all of these things to you, Lord, and pray that your will would be done. Hear us as we call on your name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. with us for the first time, we've got a gift for you. It's a book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's short, but it is great. It's about purpose and meaning in life, and it's free. You don't have to sign anything or shake a hand. If you go out the back way through the narthex, you'll see a little table up against the wall. The books are there. Please take one. If you come this way, on the way to the picnic, or you can go around that way as well, there's a larger table in the common area. Again, take one. If you want to hold up anything in prayer, our prayer team has been praying for us throughout our time in the sanctuary. They'll be here beside the piano for you to hold up anything you would like. Please go to the picnic. It's just outside. There's hot dogs. There's all kinds of stuff. It's just fun, fun, fun. Snow comes too. So just be part of it and, uh, and enjoy that. So <clears throat> in East Tennessee, you, when you learn to shake a hand, you cannot shake a person's hand without making eye contact. And so it is for us. You and I are given the amazing privilege of being able to journey out into the world and in very small and yet beautiful ways to see someone, to see them as best we can as Jesus might, as the image of God, and to believe in them, even if they're not able to believe in themselves. This is the hope that we carry, my friends, as believers in this God. Let us be those people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.